internet. This is Justin, aka Demonic Sweaters, here with another podcast, Demonic Sweaters Podcast. This is episode number 39, and uh, we're almost at number 40, which is pretty amazing uh, to me. <laughs> um, I know it took quite a while to get this far, so maybe it's not that amazing, but uh, it was on a good roll in the beginning, and then and then it kind of stopped and started and stopped and started and stopped for a really long time. And now I've been back at it again for a few weeks in a row. And so, yeah. Anyway, today I have something pretty special for you guys. And uh, what that is, is I'm actually going to be sharing some stories from back in the day. As well as playing you guys some music that nobody, well, besides like a very few people, but almost nobody has ever heard. And what I'm talking about here is the band that I played in way back in the early 90s called Lincoln. We toured. Uh, I still get emails about this band today. We were pretty popular in the post-hardcore kind of underground uh, punk movement of the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s. And uh, yeah, so we actually started out as a well, okay, let me go all the way back. I'll give you the, the Lincoln history uh, lesson right now if you're interested. If you're not, you can just shut it off. But uh, <laughs> if you want to hear this, uh, here I go. So, okay, so a long, long time ago, back in, say, oh my God, this is going to make me sound really old. But back in like 1986, I was 10 years old and I started playing the drums. Um, well, actually, no, that's not true. Well, it is, but there's something happened before that. I actually started playing guitar. Uh, before I got a drum set, uh, my dad bought me a guitar first, and it was right around the same. I mean, it was a few months before, maybe a year before. Uh, I'm not totally sure. but So he got me a guitar, but my hands were... I was still a pretty small kid when I was 10, and my hand, like my left hand, just didn't even really fit around the neck of the guitar. And so I really just couldn't even, I couldn't even pretend, you know, to play it. Like I couldn't even try to learn really. Uh, so it just really wasn't, I wasn't doing so great on it. And uh, so then uh, my father had like basically the years leading up to that, my aunt always had this New Year's Eve party. I, and they used to have a bar in their house. And I would always end up sitting up on the top of the bar. Like my relatives would sit me up there. And give me some like little uh, mixer stirrer thingies for drinks, <laughs> and I end up like banging on all the the glasses uh, to the music, like drums, and uh, it became this kind of ritual thing. And so, like my dad, uh, having that in mind, decided to buy me a drum set, and uh, I thought that was really cool. I mean, that was after the guitar thing didn't work, and uh, so anyway, maybe I'll I'll try to keep that part short because there's a lot to the the first learning drums story but uh I'll, I'll get to cut to the chase here so like after i started playing the drums um i was living in this apartment complex with my father and my sister and there are some other like punk kids in the neighborhood and uh one of those punk kids was jay demko and jay demko uh some of you may know was the singer guitar player in lincoln and uh, so me and Jay started hanging out, and uh, I started finding out that he was a guitarist. And I, <laughs> the funny thing is, is uh, well, actually, I met him when I was still playing guitar uh, before I got the drums. And there was this other kid named Josh who lived in the neighborhood as well. And so me and Jay and Josh, all, uh, all three of us started jamming on guitar together. And uh, But then, like I said, the guitar didn't really work out for me. Uh, Josh didn't really, I mean, we were all just little tiny kids. Jay was like a year or two older than me. So I was 10, he was like 11 or 12 and Josh, I think was my age or maybe a year younger. And so, you know, we were just, we didn't have any idea what we were doing at all. And, uh, Jay could kind of play the guitar a little bit, but, uh, me or Josh really couldn't. And Josh, he ended up moving and I ended up getting the drums and then we started hanging out with this other fella, this other kid, 
uh, who lived not in the same apartment complex as me and Jay, but he lived pretty close. He was like a street away, and his name was John Harrod. And John Harrod was uh, the other guitar player uh, for Lincoln. And so, yeah, right then you have most of the band uh, forming. And I was 10, Jay, like I said, I was 10, Jay was 12, and I think John was the oldest, and he was either 13 or 14. And so at that point, after we met John, I had the drum set already. And John had, John had his, st- like, more together than the rest of us at that time. He, I remember he had, like, a couple amps and, like, a bass or something and guitars. And, like, he had, like, several things. And so we started, you know, messing around with this stuff. First in my uh, bedroom of the apartment, which is insane, like, thinking back that, I was actually playing loud music with amplifiers and drums in my bedroom of like this apartment was like one of those like uh, apartment buildings that had like units, like different buildings that had like four units per building or eight units or something like that. So like, I mean, I was like right up against people like banging on the drums and like nobody cared somehow. But so anyway, we started jamming together and um, eventually the, like manager of the apartment complex she heard us jamming or something and there was like this party room that was up in like the uh i don't know it was like in the main area of the of the complex and this complex was called timberline or timberland timberline timberland timberline timberline apartments and up in the center area like where the management office was they had this party room and she was like, "Ah, oh, you boys can use the party room. And so, like, she let us basically rehearse in this party room. And at this point, um, we turned, you know, basically what started happening now is John was playing guitar, I was playing drums, and Jay was playing bass and singing. And I think John might have been singing, too. And uh, we were just jamming, and uh, I don't know if we had an, a band name at this point. But we we jammed a lot, and at one point I used to have some recordings of that stuff, like old cassette recordings, but I have not been able to locate them for several years, which is a shame because I did have them for a long time. Um, but I remember they were really funny because uh, we knew about tuning, but we didn't know, like Jay and John, like they would tune their guitars personally, <laughs> like not to a tuner, you know, just by ear, uh, and then not tune to each other. So like they were like the guitar was in tune to itself, but not in tune with the other instrument, which was like it created like when I remember those recordings listening to it back, it made them have this really dissonant, like weird quality that was completely unintentional, but was actually pretty cool. So, uh, yeah, I'll pause right here and I'm going to play you guys one of our unreleased tracks and, uh, For some of you, I think this is going to be pretty exciting if you do find this. Like, I know there are some hardcore Lincoln fans out there still. And, uh, but at this point, um, this iteration of the band was, well, okay. Uh, well, I'll explain it later, but I'm going to play one of the unreleased tracks. This one is called Starter, and this was recorded in probably, oh, I want to say 1991, 91 or 92. Something like that. I'm not totally sure, but I'm going to go ahead and play it right now.
Okay, so that was Starter by Lincoln. Well, actually, at that point, we were still called Ice Fan, but I'll get into that here in a little bit. Uh, back, uh, and I'll also tell you some more details on that track here in a second, but I wanted to get back to where I was, where I left off on the story. Um, so, okay, uh, we were jamming in that party room, and then me and John uh, basically went through a string of bands without Jay uh, for a little while. Um, there was one called Livestock Release, and then there was another one called Public Distraction, and something else. Or maybe that, maybe the early version of Lincoln with Jay was Public Distraction. I can't remember. But point being, we had a few different bands, and then we got back together with Jay, and we formed a band as a trio, and it was Jay on bass and vocals, John on guitar and vocals, me on drums and backing vocals. And that was called Ice Fan. And what you just heard um, was a different, slightly different iteration of that band uh, that had, well, basically it was the full Lincoln lineup at that point, um, except there was a slight difference there. Jay was only singing on what you just heard. Uh, he wasn't playing any instrument. And I was on drums and Dan Ball, who's the, the final bassist of Lincoln, uh, was playing bass and John was on uh, guitars on that track. So um, I'm realizing this after I, I played it, I'm kind of doing, I should have played a different track before, you know, to kind of go through the history a little bit better. Uh, but I do have some really, really old Ice Fan recordings as a trio. And this is the earliest stuff that I do have. And actually, this is all, these recordings are all on archive.org. I put them up there a couple of years ago and never really uh, like advertised it or brought, like said anything to the world. I just put them up there because, <laughs> quite honestly, they're pretty embarrassing. But I'm going to pick one of these songs and uh, play one of them so you guys can hear it. Uh, but before I do that, let me give you some details on what you just heard, uh, the track that you just heard, Starter. Um, like I said, that was the uh, four-piece lineup that was the latest or the final lineup of Lincoln, but uh, there were some changes in between there in the final lineup. But anyway, um, that was me on drums, Dan on bass, John on guitar, Jay on vocals, and we were still called Ice Fan. Uh, we were play starting to play out quite a lot at that point, um, starting to develop our sound. It was definitely more of a New York hardcore type sound. Uh, you know, kind of like Judge or Burn, you know, Revelation Records type stuff at that stage. Um, there is less uh, noise influence and like, uh, you know, what later, the later stuff that came out, the seven inches that we were famous for, um, that sound wasn't quite there yet. Uh, but I do have, well, I don't want to get ahead of myself too much, but I do have a track uh, from that period that has never been heard anywhere. And I'm going to play that on this podcast uh, later. So before I do that, though, I'm going to go back to, I believe this was 1989. Actually, no, it says right here, it, it was 1988. And uh, this is Ice Fan from 1988. <laughs> and this song is called World of Doubt. <laughs>
<laughs> that's a lot of fun to listen to these days. Yeah, we were, I mean, we were children there. I mean, I was like 13. Um, I wrote all this down on the archive.org page. Let me look. I think I was 13. And let me get back to it. Uh, where is it? Okay. So, yeah, it was recorded in 1988 by the legendary Kim Monday, uh, who... Uh, he recorded basically every single band in Morgantown, Morgantown, West Virginia is where we were from. Um, he recorded like every band in the world back then. Um, so it was recorded in 1988 by Kim Monday and it was Jay Demko was 15 on bass and vocals. Uh, John Herod was 16 at the time on guitar and vocals and I was 13 on drums. So yeah, pretty insane. So, okay. So at that stage, uh, we were playing, we were starting to play a lot. Um, I had this really, really, I just thought of this. I just had, I had this really, really weird drum set then called a RIMS drum set, like R-I-M-S. And this company later became uh, the company that, that first started those uh, suspended mounting systems for rack toms, but they actually made their own drums in the beginning. Uh, and they were really bizarre. They were basically just a head without a shell mounted in a rim and somehow they were loud I, I have no idea how but the entire drum set folded up and you put it in this one case that was like basically it looked like a really thick it was like a like a i don't know like a kick drum case that was like half the width of a kick drum and the entire set fit in there which actually by today you know that would be pretty handy but i remember it wasn't very sturdy and i think i ended up busting it to pieces and uh that was why that thing didn't last. So, okay, like around that stage, though, uh, we started to play a lot. And at some point um, after like, let's see, so that was 88. So I would say it probably had to have been late 89 or early 1990 when Dan Ball uh, moved to Morgantown, West Virginia and started hanging out with us. And we were all just a bunch of punk kids and uh, always skipping school and, uh, you know, dropping out of school. Like Jay dropped out. I dropped out like, when I turned 16. I think John was the only one who actually finished. Uh, Dan dropped out. I think Dan was already a dropout when he had come to Morgantown. And so anyway, we started hanging out with Dan and then he was always around us. And like the three of us were always together, uh, me jay and john and then dan became part of that group so his four of us were always together and so it was just natural that dan would become part of the band and so jay uh just started singing uh and dan was playing the bass and that song that you heard in the beginning like i said i played that a little bit out of order but the first song that i played starter was from the the first recording session with dan on bass and Jay on vocals and me on drums. And I, I would say that was probably 1990 or 91, somewhere around there. And probably 1990. Yeah, that, that sounds about right. So anyway, the, the, the story behind that recording is pretty funny, actually, because there is this, there is, well, like I said, Dan Ball had just moved to Morgantown and started playing bass. And there is this other Dan this other guy named Dan, and I'm not going to say his last name because if for some reason uh, he hears this or something, I don't want to get him in trouble or whatever. But um, there's this other Dan guy, and we met him somehow. I don't know how we met him. Some Jay or somebody met him, but he was kind of a hooligan. Like he was basically like stealing um, college students' backpacks full of books and selling them back to the bookstore at the, at the college university. Um, and like, that's how he was like getting money. And like, and it, somehow this guy started hanging out with this and he was from supposedly from New York city is what he told us. Um, but later on, it turns out this guy was like a total compulsive liar. Uh, but we didn't find that out for, well, it was, you know, we started to sense it, but it wasn't totally obvious until we went to go record uh, that session that that song starter was from and what had happened at this stage, like he used to name drop all these guys, uh, the second Dan, the Dan who stole the books, he used to name drop all these hardcore guys from New York city and claim that he was like great friends with them all like youth of today 
and you know all of those i can't even remember judge uh whatever you know the whole revelation crew um he used to like name drop all these guys and say like you know he knew where they, they recorded and he had connections and all this stuff and so there was this uh recording studio called sra and i forget who had recorded there uh some of those bands did and for some reason we thought it would have been really cool to go up it was located in new jersey i think um go up to new jersey and record in this studio and uh dan uh crazy dan was gonna basically be our guide and get us up there and hook us up with all the people and uh you know we were gonna go stay at his parents house and uh which we did but um it got weird so like (laughs) we're going up there and uh, first off, his family was completely terrifying. Like, they were, like, nuts. Like, the I remember the guy, like, it was, like, his uncle or something that we were staying with or somebody. I don't know. It was weird. But he was just drunk and smoking, like, crazy, like, all the time. And, like, we were still just kids, you know. And, like, this guy was, like, totally terrifying. And he was really, like, you know, like, cussing at us and just being a total asshole, like, the whole time we're there. And, like, and so we finally go, like, Well, it was like a day we stayed there and like unpacked and everything and had all of our gear with us. And so the next day we're going to go to the studio and uh, the guy, Dan, he was like, yeah, I know where it is. Like he didn't know where it was. He was just making it all up. Like he had no idea. Like he's like, turn left here, turn right here, go down this road. And like we're driving around like all this time. And like we just could like he had no idea where he was going. And then like the lie started to fall apart, you know? And he was like, oh, yeah, yeah, here it is. And, like, so we we stopped, and, like, Jay called him and stuff, and finally we, we got there. We figured out how to get to it. And, uh, you know, Jay had actually talked to the engineer guy there and, like, reserved the time. So he it wasn't, like, a surprise that we weren't going to – we were going to be there. But uh, so we – but the thing is, is, like, we were relying on Dan to get... This is, like, way before there was, like, phones that had maps and, like, all this stuff. You just had to you know know your way around or be, like, unfolding a big, big-ass big map in the car while you're driving around, which, if you think about that now, it seems completely insane, but that's that's how we had to do it. Like, it was really hard. But, like, so <clears throat> we finally get to the place, and uh, we go in, and, like, Crazy Dan is, like, to the engineer guy, I forget his name, but he's like, hey, yeah, remember me? I played in uh, Redemption or whoever they were. I can't, I don't know. All, the, all those bands had names like that back then. But uh, he was like, no, he's like I don't remember you. <laughs> he just like flat out said he didn't remember him. And like at that point we all knew, like, I mean, it was, we all suspected, but at that point we were like, all right, Crazy Dan is full of shit. Like he was like just completely lying about everything. So anyway, the recording came out okay i mean for what it is i mean we we had no idea like at that point like i remember just wanting to have my snare drum be as tight as possible and it pretty much is like you can hear it on the recording and i believe at that point i was playing a tama rockstar uh like the ones with like the gigantic toms uh they're really cool actually i would love to have one of those today uh but back then it was kind of like a cheap set but now uh th- those things actually have a really great sound but anyway i'm getting off topic so we recorded and uh we did how many songs did we do i have them here we did one two three four songs and i'm gonna play you another one so let's go ahead oh i know what i'll do this one uh on the first lincoln seven inch uh that we released there was a song called union but uh, we actually recorded that on this demo as ice fan too in the sra studio so i'll play you that version of union and i always thought this version was actually better than the one that we re-recorded later uh with johanna on bass but not because of johanna but just mainly because of the vocals i think jay's vocals on this original version are much more uh aggressive so anyway here it is Yeah. 
All right, yeah, that was Union, the original version with Dan Ball on bass, me on drums, John Harrod on guitar, and Jay Demko on vocals. So after this uh, stage, Dan had, I believe, moved back to Michigan. Uh, he moved somewhere. It may, it may not have been Michigan, but he did move, and uh, he left. So at that point, uh, we needed a new bass player. And uh, we had met this girl who came to Morgantown uh, to go to college named Johanna. And it turns out she was a bassist. And I remember like both Jay and John having like huge crush on her, <laughs> but, uh, turns out she was a lesbian. So that didn't really go too well for them, but, uh, it ended up well for the band cause she joined and, uh, she was a great bassist. Um, she definitely kicked it up a notch. Uh, and we started playing a lot at that point. Um, we started doing little, uh, out of town show. Oh, and that's when we changed, um, the name to Lincoln. So, and I don't know why we, we used Lincoln. I think it was like, because of the car, uh, like the Lincoln car, like we just saw one, we were like, how about Lincoln? And like, that was it. Like, I really don't think it was like, like really deeply thought out or anything like that. So anyway, um, she had joined and like I said, we started playing. We started doing shows like every single weekend, um, just about like we would always go out of town and play like the surrounding areas, like through Maryland, um, all these little, little air, like little towns, but you know, they all had like really, really awesome hardcore like scenes in these tiny little towns. And in fact, there's a great, great, uh, show on YouTube uh, and I'll have to post it in the links, uh, of us playing Wheeling, West Virginia. Uh, during this period. And this is probably my favorite sh Lincoln show on YouTube. Well, one, because the full show is there and it's pretty good quality. And it's the only one that is on uh, YouTube with Johanna on bass. And the crowd at this show is just amazing. And the same show, Hoover, uh, the band from DC, Hoover also played. And they're also, uh, it, there's like a second part of the video or, you know, a third. And I think there's one and two parts one and two are Lincoln and parts three and four are Hoover on the videos, but it's all there and it's all really, really awesome. And, uh, so anyway, we used to play all these little, little towns like that. And we started getting a following and, uh, people, you know, they really started to like us at that, that point, you know, certain, certain places, other places still didn't really know who we were. Um, some places, you know, especially, uh, well, not, I don't want to get ahead here too much. I'm trying to think. I don't have any of the Johanna recordings on my computer. Um, those I only have on vinyl, so I can't really play one of those easily right now. But it's probably on YouTube somewhere, and if it is, I'll I'll post a link down below. But it is the first seven. Uh, is it the first seven inch? Yeah, the first seven inch that has the other version of Union on it and uh, Seed and uh, what are the uh, Stop Means Stop. And I think that's all, uh, that one has Johanna playing bass on it. But, uh, anyway, so Johanna was really great, <clears throat> but unfortunately her and I did not get along at all, uh, while we were in the band later, we, we became really good friends and, uh, we're still friends, but at that point, you know, I was just a kid, uh, still, I mean, I was only like, uh, 15 or 16 at that time. And, uh, she was in college and I, I felt like. I remember at the time, like, cause she was into like funk and like Jane's addiction and stuff. And even though I knew she was a good bassist, but she liked to slap and I absolutely despised slap bass. Like I hated it. I still kind of hate it. Like I'm not crazy about it. I, I like it when it's used in like an ironic sense now, you know, but at the time and especially in hardcore, it just made me think of funk metal. And that is not at all what I thought Lincoln should have been. Like I, I, I wanted it to be more of like a heavy, uh, noisy, hardcore band. And the thing is, is like at that time too, I was already into stuff that was a little bit different than the rest of the band. Like Jay, uh, was into like, you know, like all this New York hardcore stuff, all the revelation record stuff. John liked kind of older, um, 
classic rock, you know, like Zeppelin and ACDC. And he also likes some DC, like some of the older DC hardcore bands like Government Issue and stuff like that. But I liked, I mean, I liked all that stuff, but I was starting to already at this point was starting to get into like weirder music. Like I remember liking Sonic Youth, like when, when uh, Goo came out in like 1989, I got that album and I, I wore that thing out like on tape. Like I listened to it so much, just constantly on my headphones. And uh, I got in trouble actually when I was 14. Well, all of us did. I didn't tell this story, but uh, whew, this might end up be a really, really long podcast. So maybe I'll save that for another one. But I ended up getting into some trouble and I got arrested as a juvenile. And uh, juvenile? Juvenile? Anyway, I got arrested and I had to do community service in the public library. And uh, <coughs> I was listening to that Sonic Youth uh, goo tape like all day over and over. It's like, because back then it was like, you could only carry so many tapes with you. You couldn't have like 8 million tapes with you. So you would listen to the same album over and over again. And I listened to goo probably like, like 1500 times. I mean, it was like, I just listened to it until the tape, like the label was worn off from my fingers rubbing it. And it barely played like there was like big sections of it that were just like you know just gone from like me listening to it and plus the you know the walkmans were all crappy back then but like anyway i was already getting into this like super noisy stuff and like just different type of music and jay was starting to slowly starting to you know get into like fugazi and like things that were a little bit you know dc was changing from hardcore into more of a uh, experimental post-hardcore thing. And Jay was getting into all that. And so Lincoln Sound uh, with Johanna, it was, it was sort of a mixture between, between the, you know, the early stuff with Dan, the, the Revelation record sounding stuff, and then what came later. And actually one of the things about that Wheeling show that's so cool is there's some songs on there that aren't anywhere like they're not recorded um there's several songs and there a couple of them are really really good like there's some really like i'm really impressed with some of the like crazy like time signature changes and stuff we were doing and like all this weird mathy stuff especially at that age like i'm like damn how are we thinking of that but like that was um oh something else i forgot to mention too when johanna joined the band jay also switched to second guitar at my suggestion actually i was like hey jay why don't you play guitar too you know fill in the the sound a little bit more and he thought that was a good idea and so he went over to guitar and uh we also we started upgrading our gear big time uh there was this place in marietta ohio called jerry's and jerry's was this literally an old man named jerry and he had this huge amazing music store and he would trade anything like you could take microwave ovens, uh, lawn mowers, you know, like anything that you had, you could take it down there and trade it for gear. And so we took all kinds of crap, all the gear we had and like random objects. And uh, he liked us too. So he gave us some really good deals on stuff. I, I got a premier uh, drum kit or parts of one. It, it wasn't a full drum kit because I already had like a Yamaha bass drum. And then, so I got Premier Toms and some Peisty cymbals and a snare drum. I think it was a piccolo snare in the beginning. Um, so I got all that stuff and Jay and John both got Marshalls, like half stacks. And Dan got this huge Fender bass amp, or not Dan, Johanna. She had already, what did Johanna have? I, I think Johanna had an acoustic amp like a vintage acoustic amp already. And that thing was pretty cool. And so our gear, it got a huge upgrade and our, it just made us sound so much better. Like I remember at that point, we sounded like a real band. Um, we weren't messing around anymore. And so like <clears throat> we, we toured a lot and, and then Dan ended up moving back. Uh, or we didn't tour a lot. Sorry, I'm jumping around, but we, we did those little wink weekend shows. Like I was saying before, um, but Dan ended up moving back. And as I mentioned before, my relationship with Johanna wasn't so great. Um, we fought a lot. 
And like, it, it was getting really, really annoying in the, the van, you know, we were traveling around because I mean, we would be like yelling at each other. And like, cause I remember one time she kept trying to slap bass in this one song and I kept, you know, tell her to stop. And I was like, it's like, we're not a funk band. We're not the red hot chili pepper. Stop slapping, you know? And like, she did it in one of the songs again in a show. And as soon as she started doing it, I just stopped. Like I stopped the whole, the whole song and like called her out on stage. And that, you know, is a total dick thing to do. Like I should not have done that, but I was a kid, you know, and I was an asshole. And so like, she did not like that at all, rightfully. And, um, we got into it and it just kept getting worse. And then she started fighting with the rest of the band too. And it, like, it turned into like three against one and it started to get really, really bad. And so Dan had moved back and we were still playing shows. We still had shows booked, but we, we already knew that Dan was going to come back in the band and it was all discussed and everything. And he already went and got all his gear and it was kind of like, we didn't really do it the best, nicest way. Uh, it was kind of an asshole, asshole way to do it. But I mean, you know, we we're kids, so whatever. Uh, she got over it eventually. <laughs> but uh, so, yeah. So anyway, we, we ended up going on this this series of shows, which we knew was going to be Johanna's last uh, performances with us. And because we were going to kick her out. But like all the everything that could possibly go wrong on those like weekend shows, like the last ones did like it was just everything like the van broke down so okay so <clears throat> i remember the shows were okay and maybe it was the slap thing that might have happened then i don't know i could be mixing those all up together but um the van broke down we were stranded for a while uh and so we ended up having to get a u-haul and i forget how we got there but we got all our shit you know to the to the u-haul place and we loaded it up with all our gear and I don't even know what happened to the van. We had to leave it somewhere. But so we're driving out. Johanna's driving. And she sideswipes a car when we're leaving. And then she just takes off. And so, like, <laughs> we didn't stop. Like, I mean, she didn't do it that bad. But it was still, it wasn't a good thing. Like, we just, we basically took off. I mean, it, it was, I don't know. I, I don't know how bad, how bad the damage was. Nobody was hurt. But there was some damage, and there was some damage to the U-Haul, too. And we were like, oh, shit, you know. So anyway, we just kept going. And uh, the whole time, you know, me and her at it were arguing and stuff. And, like, so we're driving. We're almost home. We're, like, we have, like, an hour left or something. And the gas gauge on the U-Haul says we have half a tank. And we run out of gas. The tank, the gauge was messed up. And so we end up stranded on the side of the road for like hours and hours and hours. And once again, there's no cell phones back then. There's no way to like, you know, you, you had to like literally flag somebody down. That was the only way you could get, you know, help on the side of the road. You couldn't just call somebody cause there weren't phones or you had to walk, you know, walk to the nearest phone or to the pay phone or whatever. And so I remember that being there for a really, really long time. And it was just awful. And then I forget how we ended up getting home at that point. I don't even remember. I think my dad had to come or something and came and got us. Something happened. Somebody gave John a ride to a gas station and he called. Uh, something like that. So anyway, we finally got back. We kicked Johanna out of the band. And then we got Dan in the band back again. And at this point, our sound, it really, really came together. Um, we became like, uh, well, also I think right around that time is when the first drive like Jehu out, uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm imagining that I can't, I have to look at the years on that, but for whatever reason, uh, when Dan came back, everything just solidified and we started playing more and more. And then we ended up going on a month long tour. And at that point we were pretty much as tight as we ever got. Now, also, when Dan came back in the band, uh, we recorded again. And this is when we recorded the split 7-inch uh, with Hoover, as well as the second 7-inch, and then one other song that was never released anywhere ever before that I'm going to play right now. 
And that song is called Repair and Reward. There's some live versions of it on YouTube, but this is the only time uh, that this recording has ever been heard. So here we go.
All right. So that was Repair and Reward by Lincoln with me on drums, Dan Ball on bass, John Harrod on guitar, Jay Demko on guitar and vocals. And yeah, that was from that same session of the uh, Benchwarmer, Sugarloaf, and Waterboy uh, recording session. And uh, we just never released that song. I, I don't know if it was supposed to be for something that never came out or, or what, but um, it's, you know, in my opinion, not as strong as the others that we recorded. So maybe that's why. But um, yeah, anyway, I think I'm going to stop here for now. And I think this is actually going to become a two-part podcast because there's still a lot more stories to talk about. Uh, there's the whole tour uh, stories that I could go through. And then there's, you know, all the stuff that happened after that, uh, basically where all the, the members ended up going and what we did and, uh, the bands we became after, uh, Lincoln and during Lincoln's, uh, hiatus and so on and so forth. So anyway, this is Justin, AK Demonic Sweaters. And thanks for listening once again to the Demonic Sweaters podcast. Hopefully you enjoyed that. Um, if you never even knew about the band uh, Lincoln that I was in, uh, now you do. So, <laughs> you know, it's one of those things where, like, for me, it was so long ago. I mean, it was a lot of fun, you know. And I, like I said, I was just a kid. And those guys, uh, we all grew up together. We had a connection that, you know, I just really, you know, that I don't think any of us have been able to find again, you know, just because. I mean, it's impossible, you know, when you grow up with somebody like that and you know each other since you're children of course you're going to have some kind of you know bond when you're playing music together uh, i was like brothers you know and sisters with johanna even though she came in later but we did you know we we clicked even though we fought it was still it still really rocked with her in the band and, and the shows you know that show with her in the video it's obvious you know that the uh the push pull tension uh between her and me actually it actually created something really good but anyway leave that for another time we ended up did playing again together me and johanna and anyway i'll leave that for the the next podcast <laughs> so until next week um thanks for listening this is justin signing out